Chronicles listeners, thanks for downloading and listening to or watching this podcast episode. I'm back after a bit of a break, and over the next few months, I hope to bring you a few interviews with pastors, professors, scholars, experts. But before I get to today's interview, I want to tell you about a live event that we're doing. One of the scholars I wanted to interview is Gareth Brandt, a professor and pastor from Abbotsford, British Columbia. Uh, He was planning to come to Calgary this fall, so we decided that maybe we could make our interview a public gathering. So the event is being hosted by our friends at Foothills Mennonite Church at 2115 Urbana Road Northwest, and it will be this coming Thursday, September the 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to we're going to discuss a few topics: uh, the 500th anniversary of the Anabaptist movement. Uh, Gareth will be presenting about a, a letter written from uh, Conrad Grable in Zurich to Thomas Munzer, who was part of the Peasants' Revolt also 500 years ago, and we're going to be recording a live podcast episode. Uh, We would love for you to join us. Uh, Now for today's scholar. I wanted to have at least one professor who wasn't coming from or uh, sympathetic to the Anabaptist movement. Uh, A long time ago, I started engaging with and following Professor Jim West on social media. He is a uh, admirer and defender of the uh, work and legacy of Ulrich Zwingli, the reforming pastor of uh, Zurich. Uh, I was ready for a little bit of uh, pushback, maybe even some animosity, but I was pleasantly surprised by how well it went, and I think that you will too. Jim West is a lecturer in church history and biblical studies at Minghua Theological College and Charles Sturt University. He has written a commentary on the Bible, several works of theology and church history, and numerous articles on both the Bible and theology. Additionally, he serves as the associate editor for the Copenhagen International Seminar. So let's listen to what Professor West has to say. So I have uh, I've I've found the uh, bio or introduction on your on your blog. Is there anything else that you'd want me to to say? Some random guy. Yeah. Um, God. <laughs> well, that's all we all are at uh, at some level. <laughs> yep. So, uh, broadly defined, I, I guess who who would you say the Anabaptists were? What types of people were given this label? In a sort of overarching general sense, they were simply people who wished to break free from the church writ large and express their Christian faith as they interpreted it from the scriptures. That was, I think, the original intention. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a more... Uh generous uh, definition than I was than I was expecting from a, a scholar of Ulrich Zwingli. Um, well, you, what... you haven't asked any particular questions. Yet. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get to those. Uh, so then what was what was the threat posed by the Anabaptists to the European Church? Well this is this is where it gets particularly interesting, I think. So in the 16th century, in Switzerland in particular, and Germany, France, when children were born, they were baptized. This made them not only citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but it made them citizens of the earthly kingdom. Right. The Anabaptists began to promote the idea of not baptizing infants, for their putative theological reasons, the state and the church saw this as nothing less than a movement towards anarchy. They saw it as a way of making children not citizens. Hmm. And this was this was perceived as a terrible threat a threat to society itself, which is why the church and the state and the reformers, Luther and Zwingli, reacted so profoundly 
negatively towards this idea. They saw it not only as undermining a key tenet of Christian faith, they saw it as an attempt to reorder society itself. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, means that they see society as a bad thing. And it has to be changed. And we can change it by making our children non-citizens. Uh, well, that that's just anarchy. And anarchy would be the result of that, so far as the state and the church were concerned. Right. And this was, I think, the reason that theologians and scholars and churchmen and government officials all reacted so negatively. Mm -hmm. wasn't just a theological matter, and nothing in the 16th century was. It was a state matter, too. And I think in our time and place where we talk so much about the separation of church and state, that simply wasn't a reality. Right. And the idea itself was seen to be heretical. So, hence the uh, terrible reaction. Right. Um, would you uh, would you be able to comment on some of the regional differences? Uh, the uh, the South German or, or, or Swiss Anabaptists um, in and around uh, Zurich and, and Strasbourg um, versus maybe the the North German Dutch Anabaptists um, that. Uh, that would have kind of given birth to the uh, to the Munster story. Well, the, the Zurich Baptists, Anabaptists, mm -hmm. were expelled pretty quickly, and migrated to the north and to the west. Uh, it's these migrations, I think, that seeded Anabaptist movements across northern Europe. I don't think that there's much of a distinction between the intentions of the original Anabaptists of 1525 in Zurich and the later Anabaptists of the 1540s, 1550s uh, of the Netherlands. They come from the same viewpoint and theological opinion but by the time that uh, Munster is finished, the Anabaptists have wised to the fact that they will be viewed in a negative light and they have to change the narrative. Mm. Otherwise, Munster and Anabaptists will be linked permanently in the mind of European citizens. And uh, that was such a disaster for the Anabaptist movement itself, as well as for the people who killed all those folk. Uh, it was it was a period of madness. Mm -hmm. And Minnow Simons, probably the greatest intellect of the Anabaptist movement, had a very hard time getting Europeans in general to do away with the fact that Anabaptist means Munster. Uh, so, so there's not much of a distinction theologically. Their intention, whether they're in the Netherlands or in Zurich or Strasbourg or anywhere else, is to chisel away from state control of religious activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's the core value of the movement as a whole. It continues that, of course, later down in the history in the birth of the Baptist faith. Yeah. Of which I'm a member. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll deviate a little bit from the from the script here. Um, you know, the uh, one of the one of the defining differences. Uh, on on paper, at least, uh, seems to be the apocalypticism 
uh, as expressed by by the uh, more prophetic leaders. And uh, Melchior Hoffman went back and forth from uh, from what we now call the Netherlands to to Strasbourg. Uh, so his influence and influences on on him, um, you know, would have would have been in both places. Um, would would you say that uh, there was a, a different flavor to the Anabaptist apocalypticism, or or was ap apocalypticism just a, a part of the water that they were swimming in at the time? Well, <clears throat> I have to go back a little bit before that to the idea of Luther and Zwingli that regular folk should have the Bible when they put the hand of regular folk on the Bible. Regular folk did things with it that were odd and unproductive. And the apocalyptic notions that some readers of scripture came up with in their combining Daniel and Revelation and uh, all these other things, along with pretty vivid imaginations, led them down a path that became apocalyptic, mm -hmm. particularly at Munster. But even afterwards, there were just bizarre ideas floating around among uh, all these people, so that the roots of uh, Anabaptist apocalypticism are in Scripture, but a distorted reading of scripture, right. which okay. then bore fruit uh, with the king of Jerusalem at Munster and all of those yeah. other things. Uh, apocalypticism itself, though, was also part of the larger environment. You know, the, there's always been throughout the history of the churches apocalyptic fever that breaks out from time to time. In 500 it did. Around the year 1000, it did. 1500, it did. This idea that, you know, Jesus is going to return. We've got to act like it. And uh, it was very wild to be a Christian in Europe in the 1500s. Because you're in the apocalyptic fever period as a whole. But you're also in the period when the church is being transformed right before your eyes. Mm -hmm. The old Catholic church is disintegrating, and in its place, hundreds of variations are springing up. And all of these variations have their own apocalyptic imagination. And the result, of course, is just confusion and disarray. Mm -hmm. And I, I think those are the characteristics of apocalypticism across Europe. Right. Or the entire 15 to 1600s. And the Anabaptists were simply swimming in the same pond. Right. But varying their apocalyptic image to suit their prophetic intentions and to suit their reading of scripture as a whole. Right, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, the, other, the other event I wanted to talk to you uh, was the uh, 1529 Diet of Spire, uh, which, which is famous among uh, church folks as the sort of origin of the Protestant movement. Uh, as, as it relates to the, to the Munster story, it's it's also uh, sort of a, a formalization of the uh, Catholic instruction to to execute heretical Anabaptists, uh, which which seemed to sort of ramp up the intensity of uh, not just government suppression but also Anabaptist reactions to that, probably uh, flavoring the the Anabap or the apocalyptic fervor uh, that they had. Uh, what's what's your take on the uh, Diet of Spire? Oh, well, again, I think it was a manifestation of fear. These people need to be brought to heal, or they will see to the disintegration of Europe. 
Now, Europe has already disintegrated. There are no nations. There is no Germany. There is no Switzerland. There are German states, Swiss cantons. France is divided into 100 different parts. So there are no nation states to speak of. But the fear was that if these Anabaptists are right and children shouldn't be baptized and thus not become citizens, and we have kingdoms and fiefdoms made up of people who aren't citizens, then the only thing that we can look forward to is rebellion like the Peasants' Revolt of 1525. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Luther takes a lot of heat for what he said about the princes killing the peasants and all of that. But that's the general sentiment of theologians and politicians all across Europe. These people are going to destroy everything we know. Right. And it's in that light that the deed of Speyer sort of sets in motion this persecute them till they're gone mentality. You've got to cut the cancer out before it kills the whole body. Mm -hmm. and that's how that's how Europeans saw the Anabaptist movement. You've got to cut the cancer out before. Uh, for their part, the Anabaptists didn't help their cause very much with Munster, but they also didn't help their cause very much with with their sort of withdrawal from society. You know, okay. this made people terribly nervous. Mm. What are they doing over there? Well, they're plotting. What are they plotting to do? It's the same thing the Romans felt towards the early Christians who right. withdrew them into the catacombs and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. you can't trust people who hide. Yeah. And so with that going on, Speyer is just sort of a reaction, as so many of the church councils and such were. You know, they're not forward-looking. They're backward-looking at a series of events that have come up to that point, which need to be stopped. And the best way to stop somebody is to kill them. Right. Yeah, that's, so that's the, the, that's the goal. Sorry, yeah. Um, in terms of the sort of the, the Protestant group that, that walked away from, from the Diet of Spire, um, they, they weren't terribly united either. Uh, it seems to me, um, what what did that group look like? Uh, Luther had his supporters there, um, but uh, Zwingli's supporters were represented. Uh, how how did what did the Protestant movement look like coming out of that meeting? Well, first of all, Luther and Zwingli would meet later at Marburg, and Zwingli's mm. preoccupied with Lord's Supper stuff. Uh, he, he doesn't have much interest in discussing these Anabaptists. He's already dealt with them on a number of occasions in Zurich itself, and they have not been charitable towards him. Uh, they, in 1525, had a parade through the city calling on the old dragon to be killed. Mm -hmm. So relations were kind of rough, and, and Zwingli didn't really need to go and tell any more than he had already done in his writings. Yeah. Luther, for his part, loved to fight and was happy to go and debate about these Anabaptists, who he saw as heretical as the Pope. Right. So now he's got the Catholic Church on one hand and the Anabaptists on the other. Zwingli over here, he's, he's got lots of little battles going mm -hmm. on. There is no unity in, you mentioned the Protestant movement. That should be restricted to Luther's work. Luther is the premier Protestant. Uh, Zwingli, for his part, is reformed with a capital R. Okay. Uh, he's not Protestant because he doesn't take part in the protest at uh, Augsburg, uh, and he doesn't involve himself with German politics. So uh, I prefer to re reserve the term Protestant to Luther and his movement. Okay. 
uh, just for the sake of historical clarity. And then mm -hmm. Zwingli and Bullinger and Calvin are reformed Christians, reformed from the Catholic Church or reforming the Catholic Church uh, with a capital R reformed yeah yeah that's one of the complexities that i that i found digging into the munster story is uh, it certainly wasn't clear um who the other voices were obviously the catholics were were uh, established and quite strong in munster and and continue to be and uh, the the anabaptist movement as as complex as it was uh, functioned fairly um you know united in that context um but it seemed that the term that the that the other group used for themselves was evangelical or or the German equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't necessarily directly a, a Luther thing, but it wasn't terribly clear who who was in charge of that other third group. yeah, the uh, the German word evangelisch becomes evangelical in English. Uh, and it was intended by its users to differentiate themselves from the Catholic Church. We are evangelish. Uh, and it became very popular among Europeans, both Protestant and Reformed. And this is where the two sort of blend together, mm -hmm. where Protestant Lutherans, Reformed Zwinglians, Calvinists, uh, become evangelish evangelicals just simply in opposition to the roman catholic church or in better in distinction from the roman catholic church uh, that's how they saw themselves we are gospel centered mm -hmm. the evangelium uh, and we are evangelicals right uh, okay. people yeah that, that's a helpful clarification thank you um, and you were mentioning before, uh, you know, one of Menno Simons' tasks was to uh, disassociate the, the Munster movement from the Anabaptist movement at large. Uh, and in visiting that area uh, just recently, I, I don't know if that, that battle is, has been won yet. Um, I, I met with, with a group of people who I would call Anabaptists um in in Friesland and uh they they preferred to be called uh Dupsgesinden uh baptism minded uh because they would do anything to avoid the association with with Munster mm. almost 500 years later so it's it still continues uh these these words have have a lot of power yeah they do yeah. well that's the thing uh the events at Munster so tainted the water, so poisoned the well, that, as you say, even today, it's hard to get people to say, well, I'm an Anabaptist, or I'm a Mennonite, or, mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, right. because, because the, the associations are so powerful. Oh, you're one of those crazy people who took over a city, and you called the guy king, and he had as many wives as he wanted, and anybody who disagreed with him, he was expelling from the city. And then the Catholics attacked, and everybody in the city got killed. A few people escaped, and it was a bloodbath. Right. And nobody, nobody likes to be associated with that kind of thing. Right, yeah. Not so much the defeat, but the madness of the city. Mm -hmm. It just, it was everything imaginably wrong was happening right there. Yeah. Yeah. So on the, I guess on the, the bigger question, um, what would you say is the, the lesson of Munster for, for the church today and, and maybe also for scholars of history? Well, Munster teaches us a, a number of things. Uh, the first thing that teaches us is that religious extremism is very dangerous. And cult-like admiration for any leader can lead to disaster, whether it's a religious leader or a political leader. And there are all kinds of examples of this. Jim Jones in Jonestown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
a bunch of people are convinced by this charismatic guy and they go down to Jonestown and he is afraid of being turned in by the authorities and he convinces everyone to commit suicide. This is the end result of the admiration to an excess of a person. Right. So Munster is a good reminder that it's sort of a foreshadowing of all of those kinds of events, you know, that have taken place not only in Europe, but across America too. Uh, but it also reminds us that scripture unleashed from good, solid, exegetical, academic work can become a very dangerous tool. Mm. Uh, and it can become a weapon of death. Right. And that's something that I think people should be very wary of. Mm -hmm. When scripture is weaponized mm -hmm. for political means or political goals, which is exactly what happens these days most of the time, yeah, uh, it becomes disassociated from its original intention, it's decontextualized. Mm -hmm. And a decontextualized scripture is a dangerous thing. Right. Because it can be made to say anything. Yeah. There were, there, there was the famous case of a woman in Zurich who was a member of the Anabaptist movement who saw herself as the second Mary. Okay. And she believed that her pregnancy was Jesus coming back. And she convinced a pretty large crowd of people to follow her. And when she was expelled from the city because of heresy, uh, she took a lot of people with her and they left. Uh, last they heard of her, she had the baby and Jesus never came back. Mm -hmm. But she convinced a lot of people. And this is this is just one example of the day, the other example of dangerous interpretation of scripture of course is Munster itself mm -hmm. where the king decides that he's a second coming of Jesus and uh, pardon the phrase all hell breaks loose right literally and terrible things happen so I think those are the two things that Munster has to teach us primarily for today regarding Munster and the church it is incumbent, I think, on the church to, I want to use the word guard, guard scripture from misuse. Because if the church doesn't, then who will? Right. And if the Bible, a book we Christians believe is very important, sacred, if the Bible becomes a weapon in the hand of some person, then all of us become complicit if we're silent. Right. I think uh, the church needs to speak and speak clearly when scripture is misappropriated. Those are the three, for me, yeah. the three lessons of Munster for today. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. Um I guess my my last question is uh, a little more uh, creative, I guess. Uh, the year 2017 saw a, a wave of 500th anniversary celebrations of, of various, you know, Luther-related events. Uh, if, if, if they appointed Jim West as the chair of the Reformation 500 committee, what, uh, what events would, would you like to see commemorated with uh, festivities and gatherings? Actually... In Zurich in 1520, well, 1525 is a big year. But in Zurich next year, there's going to be a conference on the Anabaptist movement uh, that I'm quite keen to attend. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and I think, I think in all honesty, if we can't do it, I would have done something in 2015 about Zwingli's turn to evangelical thought 
but if I were doing anything in, in terms of planning, I would do something in 15 or I keep saying 15, right. 2025 regarding the arrival of the Anabaptist movement, because in spite of its mistakes early on, it has proven to be probably the single most important Reformation period event. And I say that because the heirs of the Anabaptist movement, both the Mennonites and the Baptists, comprise a huge chunk of Christian believers today. Mm. Huge chunk. Yeah. And our views of baptism and the Lord's Supper, particularly the Lord's Supper, where you're going to have a lot of difficulty finding a person who says, I am literally eating the body and blood of Jesus. Mm, right. Uh, Swingley won that one, and Luther lost in terms of who believes what. Right. So we've got we've got to admire the people who who gave their lives mm. for for a faith that would grow and inspire billions of people over the course of five centuries. And then I'd have another celebration in 2030 for uh, Augsburg and okay. the Augsburg Confession. Yeah. Because that is an important document. Right. So the Anabaptist in 25 and Augsburg in 30. Okay. Yeah, I, I asked a similar question to, a, to a, another Munster scholar, and uh, he he sort of points out there was sort of an event where a number of people were were baptized in Munster, and he said so that that would be the focal point for him, you know, to uh, to focus on the positives, uh, in in that sense. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, we're... unfortunately, Switzerland isn't uh, isn't an economical place to visit these days, uh, <laughs> so I, I likely won't be uh, making any of the 500th anniversary gatherings. But it's uh, certainly an exciting time to be a historian, I think. Yeah, I think so too. You're right. You're right. All right. Well, we are approaching the end of the time that I have here. Um, any Were there any other comments you wanted to make, Jim? No, I think in spite of the terribleness of Munster, what the Anabaptists have done, I think, would be something Zwingli would agree with mm. if he had been given the time to come to his own conclusions about baptism. He was headed in that direction. And when he was pressed, he reacted mm. rather than responded. I see. Okay. And uh, I think if he had lived to 1530, 1535, he would have agreed with the Anabaptist about baptism. Oh, interesting. I am convinced of it. Thanks. Thanks so much for the time you've uh, you've shared and the wisdom wisdom you've offered on this uh, topic. Well, thank uh, you. I, I really appreciate that. It's very kind of you. I hope you enjoyed our interview. Uh, a few things Professor West said stuck out to me as as interesting. Uh, first of all, the, the last comment he made that uh, his, his impression was that if Zwingli had lived longer, he would have embraced believer's baptism. And, and I've thought it over. I, I'm not 100% convinced. And, and that's not an indictment on Ulrich Zwingli. Um, I'm just not sure how a person as, as a state official, which, which Zwingli effectively was, uh, who uh, authorizes the execution of a person because of the way that they think, uh, then to to later embrace that same way of thinking, uh, that requires a kind of a, a crisis of conscience that uh, we don't see in, in public officials. Uh, the other one that I think we could have talked about for a lot longer was his uh, presentation of there's sort of two extreme realities that he mentioned um, of the uh, Anabaptist identity. One, that he saw them as uh, well-intentioned, mostly sincere Christians, and uh, perhaps the most important important movement within the Reformation. Uh, 
but at the same time that they represented uh, an existential threat of anarchy. Uh, to have those two realities at the same time, uh, it seemed to me that that's either uh, a statement of how corrupted the church was at the time, or it's uh, a statement about the radical transformative message of Jesus, and maybe it's both. We could have talked about that for longer, I'm sure, but I wanted to keep it to uh, roughly half an hour, and I barely did that. So thanks again for listening, and I hope you'll follow future interviews.